Hi there everyone, it's uh, Russell. Welcome to the Reading Fabricator. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're reading lots of books. I myself had an absolute roll. Just 20, 23, 23 has started with a bang. But I thought I'd continue on by reading uh, what is considered to be a classic work of American literature from the 1960s. And that is Rabbit Run by John Updike. Um, I lost the um, the flat cover to this, but this is actually a reissue of the um, sort of the first edition type coffee that came out all those, all those years ago. A wonderful, wonderful sort of hardback leather bound. I picked it up for about $20 in the secondhand bookstore that deals in those sort of things. And I have tried very hard to read this in the past and I've never been able to make it past, past page 40. But now I have, and I, I can see why people why people love it. I can see why there are so many scholars out there who read up on John Updike. I mean, there are many, many people out there that research him and write papers on him, and I can, I can see why he's highly well, well regarded. I mean, John Updike, John Updike is one of, I think, four four authors to win the Pulitzer Prize more than once. I think he won both of them for uh, Rabbit, the Rabbit series. I myself am a, bit, I'm a bit conflicted with the book in general. I mean, I liked it, but um, I have my flaws with it. But overall, I... I found the writing to be quite excessive and sometimes in a very great way as well. I mean, there are detailed passages in this that are just, I look at it and go, oh, wow, so that's why you won the Pulitzer Prize. There is some wonderful detailed passages in this. But then there are sections where I think they are just completely overwritten. Now, the best way to approach this book is not is rather not as a, as a, not as a plot-driven novel. I mean, there's not much of a plot in it, but rather as a very studious character study. The character of... Um, Harry Rabbit Angstrom, a 26-year-old salesman who considers himself to be past his prime. He was, a, he was a high school basketball superstar, and he feels that he feels that his life is in sort of a downward spiral ever since then. He's married to Janice, um, who of which he has a two-year-old son, Nelson, and of which she is pregnant and constantly drinks. And the book opens with him walking, uh, walking back from work. He's just quit cigarettes. He's just thrown cigarettes out the window. He's um in the bin, sorry. He doesn't drink. He's quite tall. And in fact, the way the book describes him in these opening passages, you just get a complete picture of this character. It does a very good job of setting it up. He sees a basketball game going on, so he joins in, has has a lot of fun with it. And you sort of get this, this sense that he's having a bit of an existential crisis of, all, of sorts. And that's what this book seems to be. It seems to be a combination of thematics to do with like identity crisis. There's a bit of religion in there, a lot of sexual themes going on in there, and just the idea of him constantly running away from problems. He's, he seems to be the type of character that's always running away, trying to seek trying to seek the easy answer for everything. Now, when he gets home to Janice, he finds her just a, an absolute drunkard. She's drinking old fashions, just sitting in front of the television, just completely, almost lifeless, just a zombie, basically. And he decides that he's had enough. He decides that he no longer loves her anymore. He finds her ugly, so he leaves. He he tells her that he's going to go pick up the son that's left at the, um, I think, I can't remember if it's her mother's or his mother's house, and of which he, she's also left the car at the other person's, at the other parent's house. But he decides not to. He just gets in the car and he just drives away. He leaves the city. And what you get in those opening 20 to 30, maybe 40, passage, 40 pages, is probably the best writing in the whole book. Um, it's just him driving, just going as far away as he can. And, he, and him describing the landscapes while also listening to the radio, which details things like commercials and the songs that are playing. And just seeing him just trying to come to grips with what he's just done, running out on his family. And I've, no, I've not encountered that in a book in a long time. I mean, this could be correctly identified as like a early onset midlife crisis or even a quarter life crisis that rabbit is ex exhibiting and i can't think of any other book that i've read that has shown these traits in a character i mean this this truly is a character study there's just so much about him that's interesting but on the other hand he's also a very despicable character i mean there are plenty of people out there especially people on goodreads who just absolutely talk about how much they despise him there was one goodreads reviewer who said i mean if they had three bullets and rabbit and hannibal lecter and the judge from blood meridian were in the in the same room they'd shoot rabbit three times in the head uh so that gives you an idea of what harry's like i mean i i didn't i didn't grow to like him very much he's he's not a very he's not a very good character not a very well redeeming character uh, he does show some growth towards the end, latter end of the novel but unfortunately that comes to nothing but i won't spoil it anyway but i'm just going to read a passage that is told from a, a priest's point of view this priest i think his name is eccles uh, that's i think in the book it's spelled e c c l e s i'm just going to pronounce him eccles and they're golfing and he he basically describes rabbit the way you would think of describing him i think it's per the perfect um description of harry the truth is eccles tells him with womanish excitement 
in a voice agonized by embarrassment. You're monstrously selfish. You're a coward. You don't care about right or wrong. You worship nothing except your own worst instincts. That sums him up right there. That's about that's at the halfway point of the book. So he drives all the way out there, but then he just he's at a diner, and then he decides to just come all the way back again. He just cannot fathom going any further. And he stops off at his old coach's place and stays the night there. And eventually the coach wakes him up, takes him out to dinner with some women. Uh, the coach is married, but he's a womanizer. He, he, he keeps cheating on her and introduces him to a former prostitute by the name of uh, Ruth Leonard. And this is where the book proceeds to spend the next three months in the life of Rabbit, who has run out on his wife and goes to shack up with a former prostitute for about three months. He's run out on a wife who is pregnant. And on top of uh, spending the time with the with uh, Ruth, you sort of get glimpses into other characters, the supporting characters, and how they view what uh, Rabbit has done and how they come to terms with it and also to terms with um, Janice's pregnancy, which eventually she does go into labour and has the baby. But I'm not going to spoil any more from that point on. Let's just let's just say that uh, things come things come to pass in story-wise. And through that, we see Rabbit show some re redemption, but then ultimately just fall back on his old traits again. I mean, this this character just doesn't seem to grow up. He seems to be stuck in sort of like a childlike state, despite the fact that he's a full-grown man. And he's showing all these all these things as a 26 year old person. And I'm thinking, holy shit. I mean, I'm 30 and I, I don't have any of these problems. I mean, this is, it just goes to show just how different, um, different life was back then for young people compared to today. So, I mean, when I read, when I read this book and I wasn't, and if I wasn't told what his age was, I'd think this was the tale of someone who's 40 years old, not 26. But the fact that there's a 26 year old who feels that he's in a downward spiral in a, in a book that is basically a vision of uh, America presented in the background of America during the 1950s. And from what I believe that the rest of the rabbit series chronicles the, the remainder of the 20th century through his eyes. Um, and a positive note for the book is that it actually has made me want to go and continue on with this character study to see how he progresses throughout the remainder of his life. I think that could be the, the most positive thing I can say about the book is that it made me want to keep on reading about him. Now, there are parts that I think are a bit overwritten. There's one section where after he leaves his salesman job and has ruined with the prostitute, uh, he gets offered uh, a job with, with flexible hours working in a garden. And in this garden sequence, uh, it's, a, it's quite a few pages, but I, I found it to be the most overwritten thing that I have read in a long time. And I know people out there will disagree with me, but for me personally, I just felt it went on and on and on. Uh, so I'm going to read about a portion of that for you. Now, after the magnolias have lost their grip, but before any but the leaves of the maple have the breadth to cast deep shade, the cherry trees and crab apples, and in a remote corner of the grounds, a solitary plum tree bore with bloom, a whiteness the black limbs seem to gather from the blowing clouds, and after a moment hurl away. So the reviving grass is bleached by an astonishing storm of confetti, fragrant of gasoline, the power mower chews the petals, the lawn digests them. The lilac bushes bloom by the fallen tennis court fences. Birds come to the bird bath, busy one morning with a crescent-shaped edger. Harry is caught in the tide of perfume, for behind him the breeze has turned and washes down through a thick sloping bank of acrid lily of the valley leaves, in which on that warm night a thousand bells have ripened. The high ones on the stem night, the high ones on the stem still the bitter sherbet green of cantaloupe rind, apple trees and pear trees, tulips. Those ugly purple tatters the iris, and at last, prefaced by azaleas, the rhododendrons themselves, with a profusion increasingly through the last week of May. That's one paragraph in a four-page description of this gardening sequence. And I understand that it's a it's quite beautiful and it's well written, but I still consider it to be quite an overwritten piece. Um, and thankfully, that doesn't that doesn't continue throughout the whole book. I thought that was just the only part that really. Uh, that really sort of had a bit of a distaste in my mouth, so to speak. But we find I find other parts of the book um, in, in, written in a certain detail to be absolutely ex excellent, absolutely brilliantly written. Uh, probably my favourite would have to be the dream sequence. Now, this takes place quite further on into the story, and it takes place after a tragedy, but it's quite a vivid dream, and I found it to be quite um, eye-opening indeed. During this stolen doze, he has a vivid dream. He is alone on a large sporting field, a vacant lot littered with small pebbles. In the sky, two perfect discs, identical in size, but the one a dense white and the other slightly transparent, move toward each other slowly. The pale one is directly above the dense one. At the moment that it touch, he feels frightened, and a voice like a over a loudspeaker at a track meet announces, the cow slip swallows up the elder. 
The downward gliding of the top one continues steadily until the other, though the stronger, is totally eclipsed, and just one circle is before his eyes, pale and pure. He understands the cowslip is the moon and the elder of the sun, and that what he has witnessed is the explanation of death. Lovely life eclipsed by lovely death. Intensely relieved and excited, he realizes he must go forth from this field and found a new religion. There is a feeling of the discs and the echo of the voice bending over him importunately, and he opens his eyes. Uh, yeah, that, that dream sequence. Um, and, for, and for some reason, I just get drawn towards dream dream writing in a lot of works, particularly in Cormac McCarthy. I find his details of dreams to be quite vivid indeed. But that, that was a that was a highlight for the book for me. Uh, so when it comes to reading this this novel, you probably will most likely despise the character. Uh, he, he, he is despicable. He does some terrible things. His treatment of women um, Lee, is quite... Uh, eyebrow raising, um, and particularly when he goes over to meet with the minute the priest, he slaps the behind of of his wife, and just how he treats the former prostitute, how he treats his wife, even um, after she's had the baby as well, and he's just there's just something about him that you you just want to punch him. He's a character you just want to punch, but. Being the character study that this book is, you want to keep on reading about him. You want to learn more about him. There's just little hints, little crumbs here that show a complete, complete deconstruction of him. That, and again, it makes me want to read the rest of the series. I think that can be the, the most positive thing I can say about the book is that it makes me want to continue the rest of the series. I realize that this book is absolutely adhered by many people, and I can see why. I really, really liked it. I didn't love it, but I really liked the book, and I'm, I'm glad I actually got through it. I really am. And I mean, John Opdyke got the idea for the novel when he looked around in 1959 and saw a number of scared, dodgy men who couldn't make commitments, who felt that high school was their peak and in, in a downward spiral. That's where he got the idea for the book. And that's the that sums up Harry Rabbit Angstrom to a T. It really, really does. A, a very fascinating character study of a novel this book is. And um, I will go out and buy the rest of the series. Truly, truly will. Uh, I recommend Rabbit Run by John Updike. Uh, not my favorite read of the year, but it was still a good read nonetheless. Thank you for watching and see ya.